I am Sean Webb, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Zach Poitra, and this is Your Superior Self. I'm Andy Mant, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Sue Jackson, and this is Your Superior Self. I'm Ginny Sarasvati, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. What is up, Superior Nation? Welcome back to another episode of Your Superior Self. I'm your host, Trey Downs. And tonight, and or today, wherever you're at, I have two amazing guests, Brian Hug and Bobby Corno, two of my dear friends who I admire and respect highly. These two are just amazing guys, amazing dads, amazing husbands, and matter of fact, a little statistical factoid for you. Out of all of my episodes, they rank number one in most downloaded shows. Most downloaded. Out of every episode that I have, they rank number one. That is impressive, to say the least. These two guys from Baltimore who speak their truths, who are so genuine, who are just two of my favorite guys. And it's not surprising, actually, to me, because... These two guys are just so the real deal that I I wouldn't expect anything less from their episode because it's very powerful. It's very touching. It's it's very informative. And I love everything about our first episode, which is I think it's episode 19. I think. Yeah. Go back and check it out. Episode 19. Brian Hug and Bobby Corno. The number one downloaded show for your Superior Self podcast. Two of my favorite guys. And everything that's going on today, I mean, that's the type of people that you need to surround yourself with is people that are true, transparent, trustworthy, honorable, and vulnerable at the same time. And before we get into this episode, I want to read a quote from the book. Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. I am a survivor of four camps, concentration camps, that is. And as such, I also bear witness to the unexpected extent to which man is capable of defying and braving even the worst conditions conceivable. End quote. And I think it's very powerful because of everything that he went through to say that. And think about the times that we're in now. Think about everything that's going on in our lives, in your life. You are able to pull through whatever it is that you're going through. And Brian is an example of this. He fights every day. He fights nonstop. And it is very honorable. It is very inspiring to see him go day in and day out fighting for his life and and fighting to be the the dad that he wants to be and fighting for his family and fighting to be the husband that he wants to be and and the time that we're living in now I mean he has a weak immune system and we're in a in a time now where COVID-19 is a real thing and he fights he fights he fights every day and I think all of us can All of us can take a lesson from this conversation. We can take a lesson from his struggles. We can take a lesson from his example that we're we're all fighting for something. And we're all fighting for something. 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 And people that get what they want the people that win that battle the people that cross that finish line are the ones that will not give up the ones that will sacrifice everything they have the ones that will power through the exhaustion the ones that will sacrifice their body to taste the sweetness of success to taste the sweetness of victory And we must 
continue forward, we must continue to battle against our resistance. We must continue to battle against our minds because our minds are our biggest enemies. Yeah, I'm getting fired up about this episode. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Bobby Corno and Brian Hook. Hi, I'm I'm Brian Hug. Hi, I'm Bobby Corno. And this is this your sphere. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, it's been way too long. What's going on? A whole lot of sitting around. <laughs> um yeah, th- things have changed. I think that uh you know, last time we talked, we were actually going out and visiting people and able to travel. And now we're, we're all locked in inside the houses and uh, we're not able to uh, do everything that we want to do. So let's start with you, Hug. Um, give us some updates. Like, you know, last time we talked to you, um, things have changed. So why don't you go, go ahead and give us an update? Sure. So, um yeah, the last time we talked was about two years ago, and uh, I had just found out that my cancer had returned to my lung. Um, I think I can't remember if this was before or after I had ra- radiation therapy, but I wound up going in and they radiated uh, the tumor that they found, and uh, they killed it. It, it worked out well. Um, unfortunately, by the fall, so probably four or five months later, um, one of my scans showed that it had, it had already come back in a couple of other places. So, um, and that was a year and a half ago at this point. So I do have, um, six tumors that are in my, my, uh, right lung. Mm. Um, none of them are huge, but, uh, you know, a cup, a couple centimeters each or something like that. Um, one of them is, is, uh, pinches a nerve that's right on my right right on my rib cage, which is kind of, kind of frustrating, but, um, unfortunately not something you can radiate, not something you can cut out, not something you can really do too much. Um, I was able to go through most of last summer without any therapy at all. I mean, the tumors were small and they were watching them to make sure that they weren't growing, uh, too fast and they weren't Mm -hmm. spreading to other parts of my body. So I was getting scans every like six weeks and, uh, um, it was really up to me when I wanted, when I wanted to start chemo. Um, cause that's really the last line of defense at this point is, is to go ahead and be on chemo. Um, I waited until the fall. So I, I made it almost a year, um, or about a year from the fa- time that they found it again until the time that, uh, I had to start, I had to start some, um, which is pretty long time they were pretty amazed that um i was able to go that long because of the pain it's it's uh um you know i couldn't walk 20 feet without grabbing my rib cage or being in some pain so um i was able to make it until fall and that's when we started up again so i've been on chemo now since about september um, I, I, I don't count the cycles, but I probably been through 10 or so, 10 or so cycles at this point. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it's like the, it's, it's, it's the new way of living for me. It's, it's, this, th- this is the way it's going to be for the rest of the time that I'm here. So, uh, chemo is, is working. It's, it's, uh, doing its job. It's, um, maintaining the size of those tumors. They're not, they're never going to go away. This is not something where there's a cure, but uh, they're certainly stable, which is, which is good for now. Um, and obviously the hope is, hey, maybe if we can keep these things stable for a little while, maybe there's some new treatment that's out there that, you know, a year from now might be able to put me in a better spot or something like that. But at least for now, I do treatment. Um, in the beginning, I was doing two different drugs. Um, one of them I got through an infusion where I'd have to go into Hopkins and they would give me an IV bag. And then the three pills, I had to take, uh, five pills in the morning and five pills at night. And, uh, it was two, two different chemo. Right after Christmas, 
they stopped the uh, infusion drug, the, the IV drug. Um, the side effects were pretty tough. Um, lost most of the feeling in my hands and feet. Um, couldn't taste anything. Uh, you know, had just a, a whole slew of different um, side effects that, that weren't exactly great. So they took me off that drug and they kept me on the pills. So now my is, a little, is, is not, it's not terrible. I, I take pills for two weeks and then I take two weeks off. And then I do, and then I take two, you know, two, two, two weeks off. So it's a, it's a slew of pills. I take 112 pills every, every two weeks. It's a, it's a pile of pills, but um, it's, 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 it's now eight a day. It's not 10 a day. So I guess I get a little bit of a break, <laughs> but uh, I take four of them in the morning and four of them at night and about my day. I mean, when I'm on the pills, it's not awful. Um, I get nauseous. I get, uh, I get tired. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's de definitely manageable. And then mm -hmm. when I'm off the pills over the course of the two weeks, I start to feel better. Normally the day before I start the pills again, I feel great. <laughs> and then it's, and then it's back to the cycle. Wow. That is intense. I mean, I 10 pills a day. Like how big are the pills? They're pretty big. They're like the biggest Tylenol pill that you can imagine. They're kind of like a, a big horse pill. <laughs> wow. That's great. Do you have to eat every time you take them? You have to eat about 30 minutes before you take them. You mm -hmm. got to have something in, in your stomach, even if it's a couple salt or a couple of Ritz crackers, something in there. Sure. So that's crazy, man. Um, Talk about fighting every day, right? Like just keep continuously fighting and finding the, the strength to like take 10 pills a day or eight pills a day and just continuously fight for something like your life. Like that's intense, man. It's hard. I mean, I've been doing this for so long now. I feel like, you know, it'll be five years in, in, in the, around the end of the year. So I was diagnosed December 31st of 20 of 2015. So um, it's been a long time. I, I'm surprised to some degree that I'm, I'm still here. Um, you know, the, the odds are awful. Um, certainly less than 20% for me to be here five years later. So obviously I'm going to make it um, between now and the end of the year. That's, that's, that's the goal. But uh, um, it, you know, it's, it was a lot easier in the beginning to maintain that fighting spirit sometimes over the course of the year, you know, over, over the course of time, it kind of waxes and wanes a little bit. Now it's sometimes I just don't feel like fighting. Sometimes I do, but you know, it's not going to stop me from taking those pills. It's there's, there's worse things in life that plenty of other people ha have to do than take a pill. Um, I'm, I'm really lucky. I don't have to go into the hospital. You know, a lot of it changed when they took me off that, 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 um, IV bag drug. Um, I couldn't see myself doing that for very long. It was, you know, it was terrible. Uh, I had dropped like 30 or 40 pounds and, and, uh, could barely eat, could barely walk. Um, it, you know, if I had to keep doing that, I don't think I'd have the same fighting spirit, but, but this is something that I can manage. I can keep doing. And I, just, I mean, there's no, there's no way to sugarcoat it. You just got to get up and Get up and do it. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's it. I mean, what 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 else you got? Well, it's like it's. <laughs> I mean, it's like you get through one obstacle, and then here comes another one, right? Like you're taking these pills daily, and then what happens next? The coronavirus. Like, I mean, talk about like just trying, you know, trying to stay alive and, and trying to just mitigate what you can. And then all of a sudden mother nature comes in or what, whatever you want to call it and uh, throws this virus at us. I mean, quarantine, like, I mean, it's more important than ever for you. It, it, it is. I am, I am definitely one of that uh, piece of the population that is at higher risk. Um, just going into Hopkins to get my pills is, is, uh, feel like I'm trying to break into Fort Knox. I have to get my temperature taken about four times and, um, <laughs> pardon me. Um, uh, 
it's not easy. It, it kind of it, it kind of reminds you of of how bad things really are, um, you know, especially for for people that have cancer. So we've been we've been landlocked. We you know I know there's lots of people out there that you know do a little grocery shopping, do a little of this, do do a little of that, you know, to try to get their kids out, and family out. But we've really taken this to heart and and stayed home. Um, I do go out one, once a week and and go up to the grocery store and have gloves and masks and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, we try to do as much as we can with having stuff delivered else. And it's, um, it's, it's kind of scary. And it's, it's, it's scary on a couple different fronts to be, to be honest with you. It's scary for myself. And, you know, I have a younger son, Josh, that, that has asthma. So I have to keep an eye on that because that's something that scares me. But I'm obviously, but, you know, we're worried about my whole family, but, um, it's also, I don't want to get into politics or, or any of that kind of stuff, but it's, it's, uh, it's been a weird experience to see how other people have handled this mm-hmm. and, and how they're handling quarantine. And it almost makes you, you know, think a little bit about folks around you and how they're, how they're reacting and whether or not they, they um, you know, consider the ramification like me sure you know i mean it, you know people who are healthy and walking around and don't have aren't at that high risk category it's still a concern but maybe this is a this is definitely a huge concern for me you know what i mean this is this is something that could uh you know really wipe wipe me out so it it, it it's something we kind of live with mm. Yeah, let's uh, pause there, and I'll come back to that. Um, let's catch up with Bobby. I don't know how you follow that, Bobby, but uh. <laughs> I mean, I never can. It's impossible to follow up behind Brian. Um, <laughs> nothing really new in my life, you know. We have a dog, so I, I guess it's like a second kid because she's a puppy. But um, and nothing really she's new. A, in my she's life, a man. small second kid. Yeah, I'm a big dog type of guy. This is a small Bichon, so I got to deal with small dog syndromes and stuff like. Walking a dog in a neighborhood, I'm a tattooed bearded guy, and I hear people like, "Oh, that's cute." I'm like, I'm a dog. It's my dog. It's my, my kid's dog. But you know how that goes as a parent. It's your dog. Um, nothing really new with me, man. It's just for me, quarantine life. Um, so Brian, I work down at, at an age, so right. I, I've had countless conversations with people, and like, well, I'm healthier. They're like, well, you may be, but the person you get sick may not be. So you have to think about everybody else around you. So for me, I take it serious. I don't go out. I mean, we do like family stuff outside in the backyard or front yard. Other than picking up stuff, that's it. Yeah. So for me, quarantine life, I'm fine with this. I'm a, I'm an introverted extrovert. So me not being around people on an everyday basis, I'm fine with this. I got enough stuff to do in the house. I got a kid, so it's not like I'm bored. You know what I mean? But other than that, it's just the new norm, I guess. It's scary. It's, it's like a movie. You, you don't ever wake up one day like, 30 years from now, I survived coronavirus 2020. It's, it's unbelievable to think that we're going through this. You know what I mean? Dude, it's been amazing. Like, you know, watching I, at first, I, I don't know. I mean, I still kind of worry, but it's like um, I watch the, the, the press conferences that our president and leadership have every day. And like after, was it last Thursday or Friday's comment about Lysol or um, what, whatever you want to call it? Like, I'm thinking to myself, like, what if something like seriously goes wrong and like now this, this is our leadership, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I'm, I'm watching the other day I'm watching independence day and I'm like, they have better leadership in this movie than we have in reality. Like it's crazy, right? It is. I, mean, absolutely I, watch the news. I, I never watched the news. Quite honestly. Nothing great comes from the news. Uh, for me, I just don't watch it. I get more frustrated than anything. So like my mom, she's a, she has COPD, so I couldn't even go visit her if I wanted to because I can't take that chance of getting her sick. There's no way she she can't fight a cold, let alone something like this. Um, so it's a scary reality out there, man. It's kind of crazy. Oh, absolutely, man. It's nuts, dude. Um, and, how, think- and how do you deal with it, Trey? I mean, you got somebody who's who's uh, you know in that front line. Yeah, literally. Um, she. What what makes me angry is like seeing people that are like all of a sudden like on on facebook and, and on social media platforms like you know um you know that think it's a hoax that think it that think it's not real and then like marissa will come home and tell me stories about uh, people that have it she just had her first 
uh, patient a couple weeks ago who was pregnant and was, you know, gave labor and had COVID. And she, like the next day, she looked like she had saw a ghost. Like she couldn't, I mean, it was hard for her to even to describe like what that patient was going through. And then my mom, she's a nurse back in Delaware and she actually went and worked on the COVID unit for like a couple hours. And um, I mean, they are running nonstop 12 hours, you know, shifts, you know, nonstop doing all types of different things, um, interacting with the patients, giving blood tests, taking samples. I mean, putting their lives at risk for their patients. And I mean, when you see these posts on Facebook about nurses being heroes, like in doctors, like they're a hundred percent heroes. Like they're, they are on the front lines. They are, they are putting themselves at risk by trying to take care of other people and keep them and, and help them survive this mess. And, and their family's at risk yeah. too. You know, you're at yeah. risk too when she comes. Absolutely. Home. I mean, it's, it's just crazy to me to think that people would think this is a hoax. I, I mean, I kind of understand it because people were like, um, I'm trying to play like devil's advocate. I'm like, all right, so people don't, that's because we're in quarantine, we don't see it. We don't see it up, up front, but people that have, you know, their spouses or nurses and they hear the stories know for sure that it's a hundred percent real, but it's just like, I don't know, man. It's just, you know, with the, the whole Trump era, it's been this whole fake news thing. So like everyone's skeptical of everything now. I mean, the guy in my building just passed away last week with COVID. So it's very real. It's not make believe, you know? Right. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's nuts. I mean, you know, hug, you see it when you go to Johns Hopkins and I mean, it's nothing. I mean, they have, I'm sure their COVID unit is like, I think they had tents outside and things like that. Like, I don't, I don't it's crazy, man. It, it is. I mean, you know, when I went um, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago and saw the tent outside for, for testing, um, I, I go to, I, I go to Bayview where they're not actually, I don't think they're treat. I think most of the time, if, if there's somebody that shows up in the ER at Bayview, from what I've heard, they're sending them downtown. Um, you know, they, they'll transport them downtown. They're not treating them there, but, but, uh, certainly at the, you know, you pull up to the parking lot and you see that testing tent that they have set up. And then you're, you're going through so many protocols to get into the building. And then when you get into the building, even the seating in the waiting room, all the seats are removed. The ones that are there are six, are six feet apart. Um, nobody waits in the waiting room for more than 10 minutes. You know, they, they're, they're actually timing them. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an apocalyptic, weird environment. Um, and it's scary. I mean, a lot of those people are going in there. You know, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm rolling in there. I'm getting some blood work done. Maybe a CT scan, which doesn't take more than a couple seconds. I'm getting my pills and I'm rolling out. Um, and then, you know, a couple hours later, I'm doing a virtual call, call with, with my doctor, but there are people who have to go in there and get infusions, uh, back in that, back in that chemo room. And, and it's gotta be petrifying. You know what I mean? It's not only are you exposing yourself once every two weeks, once every month, you know, whatever it is by going into the hospital, but that's time when you're sitting there for three or four hours, sitting in a, in a room and getting chemo there's nothing quite like it. It's, it's, um, your brain goes in a lot of weird places. So imagine just on a normal day without all this going around us, um, sitting there for, it, it takes a while. It takes three or four hours. So, you know, you're sitting there and your mind wanders. Um, and now on top of that, you've got all these other concerns, you know, Hey, is this nurse, you know, potentially a carrier, this person that's hooking me up, this person that's doing this, this person that's doing that. Um, it's got to be the, it, you know, I, I, I really feel for those people. And I wish the people who didn't take this serious could, could kind of see that, you know what I mean? What, what that fear is really like. Yeah. So out of, out of all this negative stuff, you got to <laughs> take it positive. So what positives... <laughs> What positives have you taken from this? Um, I think for myself, I mean, just being able to slow down quite a bit, you know, obviously a lot of stuff shut down. So like having more time to, to spend with the kids and I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, before this, I was, I was running around like crazy, man, just doing a whole bunch of different things, um, work, um, you know, side hustle stuff for the podcast, uh, conferences, work stuff. I mean, I was on the go, 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 you know, we had soccer, we had sports, school, I mean, everything. And, um, 
it's been, a, I've been able to like slow down and like, like really get to like know my kids. Right. Like to, like, I, I, you know, obviously you live with them all the time, but you just kind of go through the motions a lot of the time. But like, I feel like I know my kids more now than I ever have. I don't know, Brian, if you've, you know, encountered that or not. Uh, I definitely feel the same way. Sarah and I were talking about that today that, you know, um, we, we do a, a, a virtual church church thing in the morning and, you know, on Sunday mornings. And that was kind of the message that, that we heard from church was uh, take, take this opportunity to slow down and reassess. And um, Sarah and I were saying today that we're not looking forward to going back to that grind. You know what I mean? It's, it's, um, it is completely exhausting. You know, both of us work and, you know, I help coach travel sports and, you know, we, we've got three kids and they're all doing something. And, you know, you got 17 minutes to cook and get out the door to get to some practice or it's, um, it is definitely a grind. And, uh, you know, you're trying to squeeze in time to do stuff around the house and, and to have that time to, to cook, to sit around the, you know, the dinner table with, with your family and actually have a meal to, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of good that has come from that. I think I, I feel the same way. You get to know your family a little bit better, good or bad. Um, um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a, a, that's the kind of positive that I'm, that I'm really trying to trying to take away from this. And when things do go back to quote unquote normal, which will be a while, um, because I think it'll come in phases. I don't want to go back to that, uh, chaos. You know what I mean? You, uh, you know, maybe if we go back to normal living in, 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 in phases, we can kind of pick what are the things we want to reinvest in and what are the things that really weren't worth our while. Um, it's just something to think about. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, I think, I don't know. Sports are tough. Like I, I kind of like, I know Ava's big in the soccer and stuff, but I kind of like, I'm like, man, like we were having to practice twice a week right games on on weekends and then like i mean i don't know i mean soccer is important to her but is it that important to where we can't have a meal together like um what else um i was just grinding out on the podcast just you know i've taken a step i mean i still record on thursdays but i was doing it like two or three times a week and i was just like man is it you know i get to do nothing now as far as you know trying to get people on the on the show because it's like I just want to take that time and step back and really reconnect. And I've been reading the shit ton out of books. Like um, I just, I'm making more time for the important things, I guess. No, it's true. What about you, Bobby? I always enjoy life slowing down. I've always said, I mean, I have one child, but she does so many different things on the grind. I mean, Monday, she does soccer, so that's club talk. So you know that's practice two, three times a week plus games. Those Girl Scouts. I think she did something with uh, you met your daughter, Brian. Uh, I think in the fall. Yeah, yeah. One yep. of the things. Yep. That was cute, and she's real big into that. She does. Uh, she's in the chef school, so she does the chef's academy, does classes, and she loves that. It's just hectic with one child. Always on the go. I work in Bethesda, so you know I drive two hours to get home, eat on the car, get to the activity. I'm just enjoying the. Life had slowed down. We were kids. We were active. But we were seasonal things. You know, you did baseball in the spring, and, and that was that. Um, but I just think it's too crazy nowadays. We're always on a hustle. So that's, that's society, though. We're always on a go. So I love slowing down, cooking together, hanging out. There's less arguing. It's just everything's just better. I just I enjoy it so much more. Yeah, I went to Lowe's the other day to pick up some mulch. You know, because I'm essential. <laughs> I wanted to and shopping. Actually, that's not essential. Right. We had the same conversation. I, I I wasn't allowed to go up to to Lowe's in the minivan. <laughs> She's like, get it delivered. I was like, I'm not paying eighty dollars for delivery. I'll just wait for us to get un unessential and unquarantined. We can go to the store and get some mulch. Dude, I went to Lowe's. It was so weird. Like you had to wait to to go in. So like you know, they only have a certain amount of people in there at one time, and then you got to wear the masks. I mean, it was nice to get out, but it sucks having to like go through that whole process and like just everyone's so like no one wants to really talk to anybody because nobody really wants to spread anything. And um, it's just so weird, dude. Like, it's just, I don't know. I mean, like you said earlier, 
Bobby. I mean, this is historical, right? Like this is, everyone's going to remember 2020 for this. And hopefully, really? hopefully, it, you know, it can correct itself at some point and come up with some type of treatment or vaccine. But man, dude. Then the health, you look at, so that's health implications. About the financial implications of our economy. So many businesses are struggling. Stimulus check, that all impacts the economy. It's going to affect us, you know. So I'm hoping that, you know, once this settles down, that we don't have some type of economic crisis on our hands, you know, on all aspects. Well, are you, are you working from home, Bobby? Yeah, every day. So we just had a town hall meeting uh, last on Friday, and we're supposed to come back to work uh, beginning of May. I just put that to, uh, June 1st now, so I can't go back to the office on June 1st. I have a feeling that the person passing away in our building is really, um, he was a security guard, so if he's in our building, he just passed away, you know he had to have COVID germs everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And um, they just think that it's best not to. You know, NIH, they're at the forefront of all this, especially my institution. I and mean, My boss is on TV speaking about this stuff. So if they think that we should hold back, then I think everyone should probably follow suit as well. Yeah, I don't think we you don't need to be out. Don't be yeah. out. Yeah, don't be don't be out. I mean, I've never seen more people outside taking walks. I tell you that much. Yeah, yeah, we 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 do it a couple times a day just to get out and walk around the park or something like that. So, um, I mean, it's a beautiful time to be out. I mean, I, I love it when I go for a run. Like I was going in the morning just because of work, right? So I'd go real early in the morning, and then I miss out on a lot of a lot of cool stuff. Like I go during the day now, and it's like you just see some of the you know obviously spring's coming and you get to see some of the some of nature and hear the you know hear the sounds and it's like like you were talking about it's slowing down and actually being in the moment like that's the biggest thing the biggest lesson that i'm learning right now is being in the moment and like not trying to rush things like i've been working on meditation and stuff like that and brian you were talking about you know your mind um you know when you're doing the treatments and stuff like your mind wanders and things like that like mine was like that a lot too like i just I couldn't concentrate on one thing. It was like a, a ton of different things. But the one tool that I've used to do quarantine when I find myself like getting anxious is meditation. Um, do you, do any of you guys try that at all? I've never really had a, a mind that wanders. I guess I'm an odd breed, you know, my, I can just shut my brain down. I can fall asleep right now. I probably took a five second nap without you guys even realizing. <laughs> so I can shut it down at any given point. So I was never like my mind was never racing prior to quarantine. Um, so for me, it's, I don't ever get like that. I don't get antsy or jittery. I have no problem doing nothing and just watching the paint dry. So for me, this is, I don't really do meditations or anything like that. That's why when I drive home, my commute was always radio off, silence, solidarity. I needed some type of peace of quiet to reset my brain. So for me, it's just quiet, but that's all I'm getting now is peace and quiet now. Mm. So I don't need to reset anything. What about you, Brian? You know, I, I don't necessarily practice like a formal meditation, but, you know, I, I do. Um, I know when I need to get out, take a walk. Um, I know when I need to. to I'm, I'm not a person that sits around. Um, I'm always up doing something, you know, I, I, unlike Bobby. I just don't I don't uh, I, I don't. I don't relax well. So so, you know, this is uh this is a learning experience, maybe to some degree. You know, another positive that is that has come out of this, at least from my selfish health point of view, is is uh, chemo is a hell of a lot easier when I'm not going to work every day. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> um, you know, taking those pills and uh, going to work, working an eight-hour day, and then coming home and doing X, Y, and Z. I'm definitely um, uh, handling these cycles that I'm home a lot better. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it is one of those things where, at least for me, um, I don't like to have my mind wander off and think about bad things, which is what my brain normally likes to do is, you know, you know crap. You know, you're, you know it's, it, it's easy to wander off, at least for me, to start thinking about my or, you know, what's going to happen in the future or something like that. It's, it's a lot easier for me to just stay, stay focused and stay busy. So, you know, I do miss coaching sports and I do miss – um, some of that daily activity that, that kind of keeps me, um, thinking of, it, it sets up like short-term, like, Hey, I've got a game next, you know, we have a double header next Saturday. Hey, we're playing X tournament or whatever. It's, it's those, those little short-term goals kind of keep me going a little bit. So, 
I don't know. It's a mix. I, you know, I, I, I don't meditate, but I certainly know when I need to get off my butt and, and when I get that itchy, anxious, you know, feeling, um, time to find something to do, get up and find something to do. Mm. Yeah. I've been reading this. I see uh, a lot of people having a hard time with it. Just finding oh, stuff to do. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been trying to, um, just be in the moment. Like I've been reading this Jack Cornfield book, no time like the present. And I find that like, like Brian, what you're talking about with like that anxiousness, like I do that to not feel that right. Like I do, I, I try to be busy so I don't feel those feelings. And sometimes it could be good feelings and sometimes it could be bad feelings, but I feel like unless you deal with them, unless you sit on them, unless you sit with them, like they're just going to keep coming back and you're not going to be able to identify what it is. Like, I just, you know, I always feel anxious, but I didn't know I was anxious until I like started meditating and started learning about how to deal with that and how to actually filter that. So I wouldn't feel that all the time. Like now it's okay to feel that, right? Like I could be sitting down on the couch at 9 a.m. drinking a coffee and, you know, something starts popping, in, popping up in my head. Like you got to do this today. You, gotta, you know, I start going, running through that laundry list of things that I got to get done. And now it's like, you know, I could just sit with that feeling and be like, all right, you know, I can be aware that I'm feeling anxious and that I've, I feel, um, I'm feeling rushed. I need to be in the moment and just like really enjoy this cup of coffee and, and enjoy the rain on, a, on, you know, outside right now. I need to, you know, enjoy that my kids are right here beside me and they're actually being nice to each other for once. And, um, they're not yelling or screaming and they're allowing me to enjoy this cup of coffee. Like it sounds kind of like woohoo and like, Oh, why, why are you, are you talking like that? But it's like, it's where you find like the peace, right? The the peace of mind. And I don't know, it's helped me through this whole quarantine thing because the first week I was like, all right, so I need, I need to go since I'm going to be home for quite a bit. Like I can start painting. I can start doing this. I got to do that. I got to do this. I got to do that. Things that I've been neglecting, but it's also like, I've been neglecting my, you know, my emotions and my, my mindset, my mindfulness, my awareness. Like, so I, I've been really trying to capitalize on that. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely helped me be more patient with the kids and Marissa and this whole epidemic and try to understand, like, you know, how I can be more productive as far as internally, not like just externally and ignore things. Um, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. You know, Trey, it's funny you mentioned uh, what I have found surprising is how well we've all gotten along here. Um, I worried in the very beginning, you know, I've got two boys and they're pretty combustible. Um, you know, they, they need each other, but at the same time on any given day, they're fighting over something. So the fact that, that, you know, um, (laughs) and not just yelling at each other, physically beating the crap out of each other, but, um, they're getting along and, and I, you know, whether it's because, Hey, I've got nothing else. I better be nice with my brother. Um, at least he'll help me be entertained or, you know, they've come to the realization that this is, this is the family. This is what we got. But, um, it's been kind of nice to see that dynamic of, you know, our family just get along on a, on a day, on a, on a day-to-day basis. Mm -hmm. Just goes to show you how much the outside, you know, variables impact your day-to-day, you know, mental state of whether it's arguing or any of that. A buddy of mine the other day was like, I think we're arguing a lot. I was like, no, you was like all the time. I was like, this is great. We're not arguing enough to deal with job stress, you know, driving stress, any of the type of stress. Everyone's getting more sleep, slowing down, you know, so for us, it's much better. Yeah. What about school? I wanted, I want definitely want to talk about school. Oh yes, <laughs> Mia's doing um, great with school. Mia's doing better now in school than she ever has. But you have to know my wife. My wife is made to be a teacher. This is this is a piece of cake, and Mia likes it because it's more one-on-one stuff with the the you know if Mia if Andrew's her teacher. It was a struggle in the first one. It's then smoothed itself out. So for us, it's it's two thumbs up in our case. What about you guys? We're just gonna cancel that whole. Out. I'm gonna delete that part of this podcast because it's it's fake news. Um, it absolutely, sounds like fake news. Um, my my situation, I got 
you know, I'm still working full time. Marissa's working full time. The kids got unbelievable amount of work to do. I'm just saying, I'm just calling like it is. It is a lot of work. And I try my best. I try my best, but it's just, it's great. I mean, I I can't blame the school, you know, the school district or whatever, like who could have foreseen this happening? You know, like I understand they got to meet um, a certain level of education by whatever. Um, however, I'm not qualified to give that to my kids. Like um, I could barely get them to take the trash out. Now I got to make them do like division, you know, like it's nuts. I mean, hug and I are like all the time, like texting back and forth, like shoot me now. Like this is, this is terrible. Is it, it harder is, for Cam or Ava? Is it harder? Which, which one? Uh, both equally, equally. They, they throw temper tantrums and they don't want to do it. And, you know, it just makes it harder. Like I got to like bribe them into doing their homework. It's just nuts. I don't know. Hug, what do you got? Same. It's, it's, uh, you know, we're in a pattern now that it's not unbearable, but it's the first couple of weeks were, so I, I, I won't lie. I had a little bit of an advantage. First parents were um, traveling through uh, Maryland um, when this all kind of happened. Um, and they stayed with us for about a month. Um, they live in Michigan, but they were in Florida. And uh, they were traveling through for, for just a, maybe a three-day weekend or something like that to stop and see the kids and see us. And uh, that's when our state kind of shut down. So they decided to stay since going home to Michigan, they would just be on lockdown with themselves. Um, they they, they uh, kind of hung out here and, and helped a lot with, with the kids. And both of them are re- retired teachers. So um, you lucky SOB. I know, I know, but yeah, but yeah, but now they're gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, it, it, it's not like, you know, you know, Sarah and I are working full time. I'm working up here in my, in my bedroom. I, I do a lot of work off 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 of my phone. Um, Sarah works for the um, Department of Defense, so she's downstairs in our little office area, which is just an un it's a it's an open room in the front of the house, and she's trying to work, and the kids are trying to do stuff. You know, a couple rooms away, and they gave Grandma and Grandpa a ton of fits. Um, at least you know the twins did. Um, it's just so much work. It's, it's overwhelming for their brains to, to process, you know, they see that daily list of things that they need to do. And it's, 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 it causes more anxiety, I think for them than it does, than, than we can probably even process as, you know, adults. Um, I have a sixth grader and, uh, he's, he deals with some, some anxiety issues that, that I also have. Um, so I luckily enough, you know, genetically pass those along and he um he dealt it it was really hard for him in the beginning he looked at his week's worth of work and thought he had to get it all done in a day you know i mean that's just his personality well i'll I'll bang this out and then i'll have the rest of the week off but soon you realize that you just physically can't so um he works super independent now i don't have to worry about him as much um he does get his work done in about three days so he takes thursdays and fridays off Nice. Um, nice. He, he takes, uh, you know, he, and it's not, he's, you know, mid, mid, middle school is a little different. I feel like they, they have a little more of a set system. Um, not that they're doing virtual learning or anything like that, but at least there's more check-ins with your teachers and, and your classes. And, you know, the workload doesn't seem to be as ominous. I mean, let's think about it. The fact that he's working from, from let's say, 9 o'clock until lunchtime, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and he's done for the week. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not awful. Um, the twins are in third grade and it's, it's a, it's kind of a mess. Um, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that we have a printer and we have computer paper and we have the ability to, to, you know, and Sarah does 99% of this, um, at night she prints out all the work for the next day and all that kind of stuff. Cause we're supposed to be getting these packets in the mail and they're coming, but they're coming late and they and they don't have all the stuff and you know i i can only you know i feel bad for the parents that have to sit and wait for that stuff yeah um, it could be it, it you know it's got to be a nightmare heck you know the other day ellen um a chromebook showed up from the from from the twin school mm-hmm. just sitting around in a regular ups box rattling around with no bubble wrap or anything but um 
I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Um, I, I, I guess, you know, it, it's been, it's been, a ch- I'm not a teacher. I'm not a patient person. Um, I don't want to pretend that I ever will be. I, I know. Uh, I'm doing, I've seen I'm you doing my best. I, you know, Trey has seen me at my best. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to lie that it's, 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 anxi- you know, I like Saturday and Sunday when I don't have to worry about it. No. Um, I go to bed Sunday night and I'm like, Oh crap, we got to do this again. It's, it's hard. It's, um, you know, you're sitting down with two kids in the same grade level and I, they both work at completely different speeds. Um, and Lily's on an IEP, you know what I mean? So, and, and she's getting no services, which is, or limited services, which is, you know, to, to me, a big issue. Um, you know, Josh is done relatively quickly. I have to take it, you know, we have to take it a lot slower with Lily. Um, it's, it's definitely a struggle. And in the meantime, you know, Sarah and I have to talk first thing in the morning, like who's got what conference call when, so we can trade off and, you know, who's going to start the schooling, who's going to finish it. It's, it's, um, it's not easy. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't foresee us going back. I'm just going to show you they're just it. Um, they pushed it out to May to May fifteenth or something like that. But no I chance to go back to school here. I I just don't see it. Um, you know, selfishly, I'd like them to go back just so they're away. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I have to sit there and think to myself, Brian, do you really want them going back, being exposed, bringing it back to the house? I mean, there's so many risks that, that you know come with that. So I, I mean, guess we just got to get used to it. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I think teachers should get raises immediately. I think um, they deserve every penny that they get paid. Uh, tell Angie, I pre- I thank you for her service, Bobby. When you see her, um, she, she's doing it. I'm not taking any credit, like zero. She I'm not. I'm not thanking you. I'm thanking thank thank her, please. Not you. I just want to make it known for everyone. I've done zero. It's all <laughs> Angie. So. It's just different, you know. She's in, we're in a different position than you guys. You know, I'm downstairs in the corner working all day. And yeah. able to juggle yeah. her job and be there for Mia nonstop. So it's different. I do think that the schools have, well, at least in our situation, have kind of overloaded us with schoolwork the first couple of weeks. I understand they're not in class for eight hours, but the multiple book reports due in one day. I mean, there's just been a lot of stuff in the very beginning that had to get scaled back a little bit. Yeah, scale back for sure. Um, how much beer have you guys been drinking because of this? Zero. Zero. I have had not a sip of alcohol since at least before March. Really? What about you, Brian? I I, I try to stick to one a day, uh, one a day. mostly because of the chemo. But uh, that's not to say I'm not going to have one one beer and then a glass of wine. But <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I, uh, but but. Uh, you know, I, it's, it, you know, it's one of the, I, it, to me, it's the uh, close of the day. It's almost like a routine. Mm-hmm. Like come four o'clock, I'm, I wander downstairs and open up a beer. Like it's all right. It's quitting time. Yes, uh, sir. I almost feel like you need that kind of structure. You know, I'm not saying it has to be beer, but um, working from home is hard. I've never worked at home. I, I awesome. never, and I don't want to, it's not my, it's not my jam. Mm-hmm. Um, I've become used to it, but at the same time, it's so easy to take an eight hour day and spread it out and wind up check clock at night or, or even later or doing stuff that you normally wouldn't do if you were going in and out of the office or whatever. It's, it's, you know, you're more apt to fall into this trap of, of working extra. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm also saying, you know, at least to me, it's a, it's kind of nice to have a structure like, all right, I start here, I end here. Um, opening that beer is kind of the signal of the day at least to me that all right it's over now well, that's, that's my wife with wine so she'll have a glass of wine at the end of the day so right. she, we had the, the delivery came out there i was like oh what'd you get i opened it up it's like five bottles of wine <laughs> that's gonna last you like two years well she has she'll have one glass a day I mean, she's really cool. I'm good. Uh, she'll have one glass a night before bedtime and night night it's because of homeschooling you know that right that's why sure i mean the first week of homeschooling i think i was drinking a six pack a night if there's one thing I'm taking away from this society misses sports and booze. Dude, man, like how long before they just get rid of the NFL and just have like bat Madden simulations? 
well, hockey season is just about done. Basketball season is almost over. Baseball is incredibly late. I mean, what's going to happen with all that stuff, you know? I don't know, but I miss baseball for sure. Like, I, I didn't realize how much I love baseball until it's not here. They talk about having games with no one in attendance. How much – how boring would that be watching a game on TV with no one in the stands? Zero. I, w- I would watch it 12 hours a day. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> I watched more NFL draft these last couple of days than I've ever had in my entire flipping life um, just because it was something. Right. Um, baseball is my, my sport. It always has been. Um, since I was a little kid, I played forever. And, you know, I love the fact that my kid plays. And, and uh, you know, I love being involved with his team and all that kind of stuff. So. You know, to not have baseball to me is like a, a soul crusher. It's, it's uh, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I grew up in New York, so I'm a Yankee fan, but I'll mm. flip on an Orioles game every night. I don't, I don't really care. I'll watch anybody right. play. Um, to not have that, I mean, I've watched so many reruns of, of games on MLB Network or, or Masson or any of these channels just to, just to watch something, but – you know, if, if they decide to play in Arizona with no fans, you know, I think that's a structurally kind of a mess. But, yeah, you know, if that's what they do, I'll watch it. I don't care. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely. Just, it's something, you know, it's, it's built uh, to noise in. But I think you'll be able to hear – people are there. But you'll be able to hear more of the game, though, right? Like you'll be able to hear the crack of the bat, the, the ball hitting the catcher's mitt, you know, maybe – There was the, a game – there was an Oreo game – I don't know how many years ago now, but it was when we were having the riots in Baltimore um, um, that they didn't have any fans in the stadium. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. And I'll always remember watching that game on rerun because I think it was an afternoon game or something like that. So mm-hmm. I remember watching it later on that, that night or something like that. And the stuff that you heard was, was kind of cool. It was, uh, you know, you actually hear the guys calling for the ball or, or – you know, it, 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 you know, it, it, there was nobody banging on trash cans. Um, <laughs> Astros don't miss this. But uh, there, there's a oh. – there was a whole little, you know, part of the beauty of baseball uh, that you kind of heard firsthand. I, I think it'll be interesting. I think the players are going to hate it. I think there's going to be a huge revolt from the players' union and the owners and pay and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a mess. But um, – you know, I, 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 I can foresee something happening like that in June. What's your, what, what, what do you miss about baseball when you go to the park? Go to the uh, park? When you, go to, when you go to Camden Yards, what do you miss? Like, what is your Hot favorite dog. thing? Hot dogs? Hot dogs and beer. <laughs> There's nothing more beautiful than, than a b- baseball stadium. I mean, you walk out, you know, taking that elevator up or taking the stairs, and you go up to your seat. And the minute you, you come out and you can see the field – to me, it's it's breathtaking. It's, it's the way the, the grass, grass is cut. It's the green grass. It's the smell of it. It's the, the you know the perfect brown infield that's just been raked and watered, and it's just I mean it's to me it's the sounds of it. It's the sounds of the game. I love the pop of the glove. Um, I just love you know the way the infielders move around, and it's I don't know. It's just to, to me, it's just such a perfect game. I loved it, and I really miss it. I mean, I it, it, it's you know it's funny now that. My son plays, he, he'll, he'll be uh, 12 in July, but um, you start to see as they get older, they start to play real baseball and they start mm-hmm. to do some of those things that, you know, the major leaguers do and the way they carry themselves, the way they walk around, the way they do infield drills, the way they do stuff like that. It's, it's you know, absolutely one of the highlights of my life. It's so much fun. That's awesome. I, I, I really do love, I know, you know, beers cost like nine dollars, twelve dollars at the stadium. But I love having a beer, get some peanuts, sit down. You know, look at the the field and just there's a different glare. I don't know what it is, but like during the day, like when the sun is going down, there's just like this ambiance, like this. You know, like everything feels right in the world. Like I don't know if it's because it's just it's our past, like favorite pastime growing up, like historically, like just having all that history, like just that. That that you know, Cal Ripken running around the field after he he broke the record, and then you know watching um, you know through the hard times, the team come up and make it to the playoffs, and going to my first you know Orioles playoff game against the Yankees, and you know that whole emotional attachment. I mean, it's it's one thing that I miss. I, I really was crushed this year when we we couldn't go to opening day. 
we had we had tickets for opening day. It would have been my first opening day ever. You know, I've never I've never been to an opening day game, and it was uh, obviously Orioles Yankees, and mm. Tyler and I were going to go, and and uh, Garrett Cole was going to pitch for the Yankees. It was going to be it was going to be awesome. I mean, we had so you know that was one of those. Um, that week, I had tickets for uh, the Orioles game. I had tickets to see Pearl Jam, which is my favorite band here in Baltimore. Have you seen um, them before? I've seen them six times. So, so yeah, they're yeah, great. Yeah. They're excellent. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, you know, it was it, I had uh, tickets to see at uh, you know the, the movie theater over here in White Marsh to see the the you know new Pearl Jam album was coming out, and there was like a listening party that they had. You know, you would go to the theater and listen to it. So that first week, which happened to be the first week of all of our quarantine, I was like, man, this is a, this is a total soul, 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 soul crushing week. But, you know, we, we got through it and hopefully there'll be an opening day and hopefully our tickets are still good and we'll get to try it again. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, opening day is like, it should be a holiday. I mean, seriously, work should shut down. Everybody should go to opening day, hang out, drink some beer, eat some hot dogs with some crab meat on it. Um, <laughs> some Old Bay. I mean, it's legit. Um, I appreciate you guys coming on. Like, this is my favorite. Like, just bullshitting with you guys. Yeah, this is fun. I like this. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um. What 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 has been the biggest lesson though for throughout this whole ordeal? Um, before we wrap it up, um, that you learned that you didn't think were, you were going to learn, like you know what I mean, like that has just surprised you as far as um, has turned into a life lesson. So, Bobby, go ahead. For me, it's taking things for granted. You don't realize how many things we take for granted, whether it's a luxury of watching sports or family time or just or your health or anything. There's so many things that I took for granted. You want to have a, a change of uh, the way I think when this all this settles down, if it ever does settle down. Yeah, just taking things for granted, man. I don't take anything for granted anymore. That's pretty good. What about you, Huggy? You know, I, it, I'm trying to think. You know, some of the things that really come come to mind is uh, and it, this is not a cliche, but you know the 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 human spirit is, is, uh, something that you just can't cast aside. Um, we are, we are amazing people, um, good or bad, whether we, you know, believe this is a, a real, you know, COVID-19 issue or not, or, you know, whatever our political, you know, the fact that we all do generally come together to help each other, um, you know, it, it, especially in this country, I, it's it's always a heartwarming. You know, I, I think of those videos I've seen from New York at seven o'clock each night when they applaud all the nurses and doctors, and and uh, you know, some saw from Italy in the beginning of this, we were they were kind of doing the same thing, and you know, seeing nurses transferred to different hospitals, you know, through a line of people just cheering. It's 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 you know, it makes you reassess and rethink that you know we really are good people um we you know it, it shouldn't take this to pull that out of us but at the same time it's it's you know kind of heartwarming to see that we're not um we you know that we we still have that in us yeah it's just it's it's like you said earlier it's the distractions out there that that get us the technology and and you know, the nine to five, the rat race to distract us from what we truly are. You know, we, like we, you know, we had um, a couple instances where we saw like what truly is human nature. Like you were talking about with New York city, like they're all cheering right. for the frontline employees. Like that's intense. Um, I mean, that's who we truly are. We just forget about it. Like you said, like there's, you know, distractions and um, things that pop up in our lives that we don't pay attention to, which is, being nice to one another. Um, and, and then when you see it, like when you have actual time to see it, you're kind of like, well, it's always been there. It's, it's always been there. It's just that we don't take the time to look at it. And I think my biggest lesson has been that is to take the time and, and to be mindful and be in the moment. Like there, there is no bigger gift than right now. And I'm very happy that I get to share it with you two and to be in it a hundred percent and not think about other things and to be in the moment wherever your feet are, be there 
and um, enjoy it because it's not promised tomorrow, right? I mean, you're fighting for your life, Hug. And, you know, I'm sure if anybody here is appreciating this moment, it's you. I absolutely am. It's, it's, uh, you know, in the very beginning, I was like, I can't believe this is going to be something that I'll remember towards the end of my life. But at the same time, maybe this is what I needed. Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe this is what we all needed to some degree. Not, not, I'm not casting aside all the, the trauma and all the issues. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to say that, you know, this, this kind of reset um, is, uh, is something that maybe in the long run will help us out. Absolutely. Fellas, I want to say thank you for joining the show. Thank you for coming back on. Let's, you know, let's not wait two years to do another one. Um, let's, you know, try to figure something out and get back together and, and bullshit. And hopefully we can, we can go to a baseball game. Yeah, man. That sounds great. I want to say thank you to Bobby and Brian for joining the show. Thank you for downloading this episode. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to spend some time with us. And I greatly appreciate it. Please leave a rating and a review wherever you get your podcast from. If you want to find out more about me, you can do that by going to your superior um, and leave me a message while you're there. Let me know how you're doing. Um, but, but yeah, it, it helps me scale the podcast. When you guys leave ratings and reviews, it helps me uh, get this out to those who might need it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always a, uh, you know, it's always great to hear from you guys as well. So, Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. If you want to follow me on social media, you can do so on Twitter at Downs Trey and Instagram at TDowns80. Leave me a message over there. All right, guys. <clears throat> Thank you guys so much for hanging out, and I will talk to you guys later.